so we welcomed that. We also had a invitation only workshop on primary care investment. And in addition to the PCPCC members who were invited to that workshop, we also had leaders from states all across the country. Uh, there were representatives from 25 different states. And many of these leaders are considering um, implementing legislation or other strategies to increase investment in primary care. As you may know, investment in primary care is quite paltry at 7%, and these leaders are focused on raising that to double digits, even up to 12%, uh, so that we can realize a vision for primary care that is more robust and comprehensive and more patient-centered. And we've articulated that vision in something called the shared principles, which many of you uh, know well, you, you know very well, and your organizations have signed on to these principles. If you haven't, it is not too late, and I'd invite you to review the shared principles on our website and vow to get your organization signed up in early 2019. You can join about 300 other organizations that are working to realize this vision of primary care. Also, this is not your last this is your last chance, rather, to get the full benefit of membership for 2019. You can start off the year as a PCPCC member, and you can contact uh, Allison Gross. Her email's right there for more information. So this webinar is going to focus on advancing a more technology-enabled healthcare system. And this is through uh, changes to regulations and payment attention to uh, workforce uh, capabilities and human factor changes. And it's outlined in a report called Healthcare Without Walls, a Roadmap for Reinventing U.S. Healthcare. Um, Susan Denser, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Network for Excellence in Healthcare Innovation, will present this roadmap uh, on today's webinar. And she helped create it in partnership with hundreds of national leaders. Two key contributors to the report, uh, Dr. Sunny Ramchandami, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Aetna, and Dr. John Bolger, Chief Medical Officer of Geisinger Health Plan, will go into more detail. And most germane to this audience will consider the implications for primary care. Uh, Susan and I have known each other for a long time, and she's one of the nation's most respected health policy experts and thought leaders. She's a longtime journalist and has been an on-air analyst on health issues with PBS and on National Public Radio. Um, she uh, wrote and hosted a PBS document documentary, Reinventing American Healthcare, which focused on many innovations, some of which were pioneered by the Geisinger Health System, which really have spread across the country. Uh, I think Geisinger, uh, we can rightfully say, has had an outsized role in, in the innovation space. And so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. John Bolger, who, as I mentioned earlier, is CMO at Geisinger. And he's responsible there uh, for working with community partners to improve the quality of medical care for patients and members. Uh, before joining Geisinger uh, as CMO and the health at, at the health plan, he had many different positions at, at Geisinger, which is really um, just a fabulous organization. And um, John and I spoke earlier this month, and we both declared that we are um, in the Glenn Steele fan club. Uh, for those you who don't know Glenn, he was previously the president and CEO of Geisinger. He's a surgeon, but he has long been a primary care champion, and I think that's very much reflected in the Geisinger model of care. Uh, Sonny currently serves as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer at Aetna, as I said earlier. He's responsible for the design and implementation of Aetna Care, which uh, combines consumer insights um, with a focus on population health. Um, he's done many things at Aetna, um, uh, and uh, his his bio is very impressive. He's worked with um, uh, Aetna in a relationship with pharmaceutical companies, device manufacturers, and retail clinics. 
He was previously at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, and that's where we first met him in the PCPTC, and he was really part of the original PCPTC Brain Trust, um, so uh, he's been a long supporter of our organization, and um, Sonny, it's great to have you. As we know, the foundation for the patient center uh, primary, the patient center medical home is really based on Barbara Starfield's four pillars of primary care practice. First contact care, continuity, comprehensive care, and coordination of care. And Barbara Starfield's work evolved into the joint principles of the patient-centered medical home. We really took a page from Dr. Starfield as we thought about uh, the, the, the delivery design of the PCMH. And this has evolved, as I mentioned earlier, into the shared principles. So when you think about Barbara Starfield's work, work the PCMH joint principles that came out in 2007 are the shared principles, which we released last year central to all of these conceptions of primary care and really central to the PCPTC is the importance of the ongoing patient-clinician relationship. And this is really um, much of what we want to focus on for our discussion today because we know that the system is undergoing all kinds of transformation and we are challenged to modernize, particularly as we understand better what patients' preferences are in you know, their very busy lives for more convenience and more accessibility. So how do we um, welcome and um, take advantage and leverage you know, all that technology has to offer while not losing sight of our core values? And I think that's really, um, you know, uh, the, the, the challenge for us all because we do understand how much technology can um, improve the efficiency of care and make it um, uh, really improve first contact care, for example, and health and care integration uh, and the like. But we want to make sure that that relationship is maintained. Um, and so this is uh, a, a big part of why we wanted um, this August group come and discuss the report and help us think together about how do we meet these challenges. Um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion, and now let me turn it over to Susan. Well, thank you so much, Anne, and really it's terrific to be with all of you today. Thank you for joining us. So I'm going to talk, obviously, about our report, Healthcare Without Walls, as Anne mentioned, and what the implications of it are for primary care as best as we could see them as we put together our report. And just to give you a quick sense of the ground that we're going to cover, and uh, Allison, if you could advance to the next slide, uh, having difficulty uh, advancing it there. So um, the ground that we're going to cover is as follows. Uh, the vision that we uh, created as we put together our report, and a little bit of background on our initiative, uh, I'll uh, mention our summary recommendations, and then, of course, the main point here is to talk about what best we see as the implications. Next slide, thanks. So we did this work with the support of many foundations and corporations. You can see them mentioned here. And we did it by dint of organizing five different work streams with more than 200 participants. And I'm very happy to say that John and Sonny the thinking on that score. And then very important area about the implications for the collective healthcare workforce, not just the physician workforce, but the nurse work workforce, nurse practitioners, uh, specialists of all sorts, uh, community health workers, even evolving roles like somebody who's in charge of making sure the technology works in a healthcare system, uh, et cetera. So we looked at all of that. And if we go to the next slide, in effect, what we said was uh, what we challenged before the group was put, let's tackle some of the really big questions that we need to address as we think about innovation. 
And one of the obvious ones, and we're obviously far from the first people who have asked this question is, what if we had, instead of a sick care system, which we will, I think, mostly agree that we have largely in the U.S., what if we had a health care and a health-inducing and health-promoting system more so than a sick care system? And also, what, what if we had one that went to people rather than expecting people to go to it? We know that once upon a time, there were things like house calls and there were physicians riding over prairies to call, call on people in their homes. And that world was replaced by the more uh, uh, industrial model of healthcare that we've had in place, certainly for the last 50 years. Well, what if we had a system that really did go back to going to people rather than expecting people to go to it was the first question we asked. Next slide. Uh, we also asked for all of the areas of healthcare that involve laying on of hands, and of course there are many of them, if you are in a terrible traffic accident, you want to be taken to a major trauma center and have uh, your surgery performed there, no question about that. But there are a whole lot of aspects of healthcare that are not about the laying on of hands. They really are about exchanges of information. And we asked, why hasn't that moved the way almost all other exchanges of information have begun to move in our society and our economy, which is to say virtually. We are having a virtual exchange today, for example, of, in, of uh, information. So why is healthcare still so stuck in the world where information can only be exchanged person to person in usually, uh, typically in healthcare settings was our other big question. So leaving out the laying on of hands, what about all the rest? So we put those two questions in front of the group and essentially to invoke a, a sentence used by my friend uh, Mark Fendrick out at the University of Michigan, why is it that we have Star Wars medicine in this country that is still largely delivered on a Flintstones delivery platform in effect? And if we go to the next slide, we said, Shouldn't we at least think about advancing from the Flintstones age? And again, let's go to the next slide. Shouldn't we at least think about advancing from the Flintstones age to the age of the Jetsons? Some of us are old enough to have watched this cartoon back in 1962. And you can see this is how back then they envisioned the healthcare of the future being delivered by a doctor over a big television screen. Okay, so that was 1962. Now, if we go to the next slide, we will see that uh, other people cotton onto this, and now advance, if you would, so that we get to the text. Uh, Kenneth Bird, uh, who was an internist up at the Leahy Clinic in Burlington, got the bright idea in 1968 to set up the first telemedicine system, which was actually designed to link people at Logan Airport in Boston with doctors at Mass General Hospital, where Dr. Bird uh, had, had been gone. And so that system was set up. You can see it functioning here. It was a little primitive. The technology of the 60s was not what we have today, but it worked. And it was in place for about five years before it was abandoned in the 1970s. So why did that happen is an interesting question. And why is it all these years later that we're just getting back at thinking about virtual exchanges of healthcare information. So if we go to the next slide, we asked, would we prefer a system of healthcare without walls to what we have today? And if we go to the next slide, we started to imagine lots of different kinds of people who might be interested in a system of healthcare without walls. And we created a number of scenarios which are contained in our report. What about Doris, a woman with mild cognitive impairment who wants to stay at home as long as possible, is having some issues remembering to take her medications and can't always get organized to get to the doctor's office on time, but needs support to stay in her home alone as long as she possibly can? Or what about a young uh, teenager with type 2 diabetes who wants to live his life as normally as possible, doesn't want to be in doctor's offices all the time, and is keen to learn aspects of self-management and self-care, but needs some support remotely? 
Or what about a young disabled child who uh, is the, the offspring of a single mother who has a lot of trouble holding her job and getting him to his various different medical appointments and including uh, mental health support? Or what about a woman recovering from breast cancer who is trying to get back in the workforce but needs some uh, support and management uh, at home? Or what about an elderly couple living in a rural area who uh, don't live near uh, medical facilities but need some management support for their various chronic conditions? Or what about a woman with uh, a low-income African-American woman who's at a high risk of premature birth, uh, who's struggling uh, on a low-wage job, has difficulty if she takes any time off from work, she loses her pay to get to her prenatal appointments, but she really needs close monitoring and management over that period and probably support from doulas and other kinds of people. Or what if we had another pandemic flu epidemic and we were telling people that they needed to socially isolate at home and we were canceling sports events and all kinds of things and telling people to stay at home? How would we manage our relationships with them if we don't want them storming into healthcare settings all thinking that they are coming down with a deadly flu? So we started to think there were a lot of people who might be interested in healthcare without walls. Next slide. Next slide, please. And so as we looked around, we, uh, I'm sorry, go, uh, go back. I didn't mean to say advance two slides. As we looked around, we saw that there were lots of elements already in the environment that suggested and it really underscored the famous observation of William Gibson, which is that the future in many respects has already arrived. It's just very unevenly distributed around the country at this point. And now let's go to the next slide. And what we know from the most recent data, this is from a, a letter published in JAMA last month, uh, it, this is an uh, analysis of telemedicine use in a very large commercially insured population. You can see the findings. Uh, telemedicine use is still largely uncommon. It was of, as of 2017, but it did increase substantially over a 12-year period. The users in primary care are younger than average and more likely to reside in urban areas. Um, there was a very rapid increase in growth in primary care telemedicine in 2016 and 2017, mainly because self-insured employers we're starting to cover direct-to-consumer telemedicine as a benefit for their employees, and that the brisk adoption seems to reflect consumers seeking convenience rather than primary care supply. So that even if you go to areas like Boston, which has the highest share of primary care providers of any state in the country relative to population, and it takes two months to get an appointment with a primary care doc, people who had the option of a direct-to-consumer telemedicine benefit took advantage of it. So that tells you some interesting things about the environment in which uh, people are inclined to take up telemedicine. So let's go to the next slide. As we looked around, we saw other examples outside the primary care context where uh, these kinds of approaches were working quite well. This is Ray Dorsey, who is a neurologist up at the University of Rochester. Ray told me recently he has not set foot in a physical clinic in five years, yet he sees multiple patients every day and he sees them virtually. He primarily treats patients with Parkinson's. And if we go to the next slide, uh, Ray participated and was one of the PIs of a large national trial, controlled trial, of virtual house calls for people with Parkinson's disease. This was funded by PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And you can see the objective of the trial was to determine whether providing remote neurologic care into homes was feasible, beneficial, et cetera. The answer the study showed was yes. Uh, the groups was randomized. Half the people were having usual care with a neurologist, physical visits. The other half had some physical visits augmented with many virtual visits. The care was comparable across both groups. And if we go to the next slide, the interesting thing was what patient satisfaction was. And you can see here some meaningful share of people said they had a better personal connection with their clinicians by virtue of the virtual visits. Some meaningful shares said the care was better. 
lots of people thought it was more convenient. Lots of people thought it was more comfortable. And if we click uh, on the final bar, we can see that 55% preferred the virtual visits. And if you're a Parkinson's patient and you can't drive anymore and you probably are dependent on a caregiver getting you to a medical appointment, and the study showed that the average time people needed to get to a half hour visit with a neurologist was four hours. You can imagine why people preferred the virtual visits overall. So let's go to the next slide. As we looked at like uh, examples like that and saw other places, other systems in the country, the VHA, the Veterans Health Administration being a case in point. You know, where, if you have a system where payment isn't the barrier, and licensure isn't the barrier, you can do a lot. And the VA has done a lot to make investments in telehealth with a total of 2 million encounters to, uh, as you see, more than 700,000 vets in 2017. And that's just on the telemedicine side because there are also lots of vets being monitored at home by a cell phone. There's uh, interest now in, uh, there's a, underway a pilot telehealth program in psychotherapy. Uh, particularly for vets with PTSD in rural areas. And there's a meaningful core of vets now testing out devices like Fitbits and wearables to share information with their providers. So in areas where, as I say, there aren't a whole lot of barriers uh, to innovation, we're, we are beginning to see it. Next slide. We also looked at other examples, Ohio State College of Nursing, where uh, through the campus, the main campus in Columbus, telehealth visits are provided to satellite campuses. Uh, you can have a telehealth visit with a registered nurse uh, and with nurse practitioners in Columbus if you're out in Lima, Ohio on the campus there. And there's a plan now to train the nurse practitioner students through preceptorships to conduct telehealth consults in a team setting with others, nurses, dietitians, and pharmacists. So they're trying it. Future is a little bit distributed there. If we go to the next slide, we can see examples of, of instances where, in addition to provision of care, there are efforts to use these approaches to connect primary care providers with the rest of the system in ways that deal with some of the stresses that, that uh, we all feel in a fragmented system. So out in LA, there was a group of primary care providers in federally qualified health centers who were running into some real difficulties when the kids they were seeing, they felt had to be referred on for mental health care at community mental health clinics. The largely Latino uh, parents of these kids uh, who were being treated basically didn't wanna go to the community mental health clinic. They were concerned about the stigma of mental health treatment. And then the primary care docs would get frustrated because the parents might take, go one visit to the community mental health clinic, but then they wanted to come right back to the federally qualified health center for management of pretty sophisticated psychotropic medications. And those docs rebelled. So what did they do? They basically hatched some virtual communication strategies. They have asked parents to watch a video where they got to meet via video all the people at the mental health center. They scheduled uh, regular teleconferences and video conferences connecting the PCPs to the community mental health care providers so that they could jointly case manage the patients, et cetera, et cetera. And things are working a whole lot better now. And if we go to the next slide, we can see another example of this kind of jerry-rigged approach. Community Health Plans of Washington is a health plan that serves Medicare and Medicaid patients largely. They've connected with a group called MAVEN, which is a group of volunteer specialists around the country. So this is a freebie. And what they've set up is a system where the primary care docs can either set up visits in their offices with their patients seeing specialists right away in real time, or they can, the docs can consult with a specialist on their own to help them in the management of their own patients. And this can happen because it's free. <laughs> There's no payment that people are fighting over. These docs, these specialists have volunteered their time. So what if you could have a system where this was more universal? Uh, really became an interesting question to ask. And as we know, things are continuing to evolve. Uh, Walgreens has now set up 
uh, telehealth capacities from pharmacies in New York City right into the ED at New York Presbyterian so people can come in. Uh, they, they might have some issue that they really don't know what's going on. They could probably take themselves to a primary care doctor, but they're not doing that. They're walking into Walgreens, they're sitting down at the kiosk and they're having immediate consultations with ED docs. And recently, one of the people in, the, in this arrangement was telling me about a middle-aged man on Medicaid who came in for a consult. The, the docs uh, took one look at him and had him describe his symptoms and immediately uh, discerned that he was probably in the midst of a, an apparent heart attack and sent an ambulance and brought him right to the hospital right away. So the way the world works, right? But it is evolving this way. And now I've managed to make this work again. So I just got, successfully moved us to the next slide. As we know, the world is evolving and Sunny can speak to this later. We now have the CVS Aetna acquisition complete. And what does Larry Merlo, the head of CVS say that they are intending to do? They are intending to reinvent the front door of healthcare. Now I will ask you, what do you think the front door of healthcare is? We would argue it would be primary care, right? But it's obviously, in Larry's view and the view of others, in need of some reinvention to transform the consumer healthcare experience. And very importantly, you see there the words build healthier communities, really be a, a force in a health promoting system through an innovative care model that's easier to use, less expensive, and put consumers at the center. So that's the goal of CVS Aetna combination, and it's not just by having people walk into CVS pharmacies. There's a big commitment to telehealth and other approaches evolving there. And if, if we go to the next slide, if, oops, sorry, let me go back here. If we think about others in the environment that are out there, uh, the case of Amazon, uh, uh, here we go. The, we have uh, Amazon with 90 million Prime subscribers in the U.S. now, more than 100 million worldwide. The company shipped more than 5 billion items in 2017. It has bought PillPack, a pharmacy service. It also sells online such things as this uh, uh, digital otoscope that you can buy for $48.99 that if you're a mother with a kid who has a potential ear infection, you can stick this in the kid's ear and uh, send this, uh, snap this photo on your phone and send it directly to your pediatrician to help evaluate whether the kid has, does in fact have an ear infection or not. So if we can imagine the world in which online access to doctors, which could conceivably happen tomorrow for 90 million Amazon Prime subscribers, and pharmacy and even devices for self-care could all be accessed in the same place. What would primary care look like in that environment? Well, as we thought about all this, we said, you know what? It's also not really all about the technology. It's about using the technology to put people and systems together in new ways. And we can get really hung up on digital health and M health and everything else but it's really about systems evolving here, using technology and using people in different ways. And the potential of all of this is enormous. Obviously, we would drastically increase care convenience. We're already seeing increased access, especially in underserved areas. Look at the ability of community health plan to connect their patients with premier specialists in other parts of the country. We are leveraging and extending that existing provider base through examples like that. We're also universalizing and democratizing the knowledge and expertise that is now housed in a lot of places, but not universally distributed. But we could make it immediately distributed through these approaches. And we could reduce a lot of the unnecessary friction in the system, the things that are going on that don't buy one iota of greater health driving to doctor's appointments, looking for parking, sitting in waiting rooms, taking a day off from work, losing wages. All of that amounts to nothing in terms of increased health, but a lot of friction. 
And it's hard for us to believe as we looked at all of this that you couldn't drastically cut costs. As you do things like think about reducing the huge physical footprint of, of, the, of healthcare institutions, the carbon footprint, everything else. So we thought about all of that and we also thought about the enormous potential to, as you moved healthcare out into the community, really increasing the attention that is already coming into play in so many places on the social issues in communities that really do contribute to poor health and that do drive healthcare utilization, hunger, lack of transportation, housing insecurity. You know, if you had just more providers dropping in on patients in their homes, and I don't mean necessarily docs, community health workers, others sensitive to the fact that people's environment is going to be a huge driver of their health care and their health status. So why not address that? And why not really meet patients where they are, including at home, through all of these technologies? And by the way, a lot of this is not very advanced. It, we're talking about Skype. We're talking about smartphones. Um, we don't even have to get down the road to AI and everything else for a few years. If we just use these much more commonplace things today, we could make a huge difference. Now, our project said there are multiple, multiple obstacles to overcome to get there, uh, starting with inertia. Systems have to recognize that the world is changing. They got to adapt to the fact that, yes, we've got a lot of sunk costs and plant and capital, but maybe the world is changing enough that we've got to move beyond a fixation about all of that. Clearly, payment models to support new avenues of care are critical, and Sunny and John, I know, will speak to that. We're probably going to need a different or at least a differently trained workforce with a lot more emphasis on teams. We're going to have to take into account human factors. Who can use these technologies? Who can't? Uh, are we going to write off everybody who's got Parkinson's saying they're not, they're never going to see patients on or doctors on Skype? Doesn't look like we should, but what else do we need to do to support their ability to have meaningful encounters? There are lots of state laws and regulations that still stand in the way of activities like telehealth. And there, of course, there are licensure issues and scope of practice issues as well. There are data and privacy and security issues, and we have a whole chapter in our report uh, that discusses these. And very fundamentally, we do have lack of high-speed broadband access, internet connectivity, cellular 5G technology in a whole lot of the country, which is kind of embarrassing because even countries like Botswana have a plan to get to universal broadband access but it's not even on the table here in the United States. So we agree there's a lot to overcome, but there are also lots of forces that are moving us in the right direction. And slowly but surely, the uh, great gargantuan Medicare payment system is even waking up and smelling the coffee. And many of you will know that in 2019 and 2020, the so-called originating site rules in Medicare fee-for-service are beginning to change. Those have effectively militated against provision of telehealth services to homes or other settings, but those are changing. Under the Medicare's, uh, Medicare Chronic Care Management Programs, patients can have 24-7 access to a health professional in emergencies with no telemedicine restrictions. Uh, clinicians can now be paid under the Medicare fee schedule as of 2019 for virtual check-ins with established patients and also to uh, remotely evaluate recorded video or other images and also to consult interprofessionally that way. Uh, in 2020, the Medicare payment system is going to uh, basically allow home health agencies to count remote monitoring in as part of their allowable costs. So we're going to see home health agencies doing remote monitoring into homes, not actually having to have a person there all the time. Telehealth is now reimbursed for Medicare beneficiaries with a substance use disorder diagnosis or a co-occurring mental health disorder as a consequence of the support legislation that was passed in October. And Medicare Advantage plans, of course, are now going to be able to offer supplemental non-medical benefits such as meal delivery and transportation. So Medicare is recognizing that healthcare should move out beyond the walls and is starting to enable that in a big way. Well, what does all of this mean for primary care? 
very simply, I think everybody who cares about primary care has to get ready. And not just docs, but nurses and everybody else who's in the business of providing primary care. Uh, at least to begin to conceptualize how the very important principles that Anne mentioned of the patient-centered medical home are going to be uh, enabled to be carried out differently with new technology, new team members, and the kinds of things that we know are going to be features of the environment and in many places already are. It is time to start talking about how to bring this to patients because as we see a very significant number of people want it. They may be younger people today, but in 10 years, they're gonna be middle-aged people and older people uh, because uh, who will have started with these new modalities of care in the here and the now. So with that, let me bring my part of this to the, a halt and turn over to John and to Sonny. And I wanna ask them both, first of all, having participated in shaping this report, what will each of you, what was your biggest personal takeaway about the need for system transformation, and particularly for primary care transformation, coming out of the experience of having uh, thought through all of this with us. Um, maybe, John, I'll start with you. Sure, great. Thanks, Susan. And, and uh, thanks, Anne, for, uh, for having us. This is a, a great discussion. I think, you know, as Susan said, Sonny and I, the one of the area we focused on uh, was reimbursement. And I think um, you know, one of the striking take homes for me and, you know, maybe obviously being in an integrated delivery system and now having a title as uh, chief medical officer help plan, maybe, uh, this is partly because of my way of thinking as well, but, you know, the current economic model we're in and fee for service, um, isn't necessarily, and, and I don't think is conducive, uh, to innovation and, and, and thinking differently about how care is delivered. And, you know, a lot of what we see um, around this kind of the healthcare that wall is how do you leverage a technology? And I think it was said, well, technology is really a tool, but you need the systems in place around it has been, you know, how, it's, it's almost been, how do you add the technology as a one plus? Uh, and part of the reason why I think it hasn't been adopted is because of that. And, you know, I do think there's a, a wonderful opportunity um, in primary care to say, uh, you know, how do we look at a different payment model, uh, whether that's, you know, I realize capitation is sometimes a bad word, but, you know, a global payment model where you're saying, well, you know, we have this um, this group population of patients that we need to take care of, and and, and what are the ways that we can keep those patients that's in that group healthier. And and I think what you'll see is in primary care, you'll see much faster innovation ar around uh, what happens in that space. And I think what also kind of strikes me is, is you'll have uh, healthier patients and it's, it's a way for primary care to really begin to take the lead because the, you know, the sick care system is, is, uh, Susan was talking about in our current fee-for-service system. I think we all know the way it's paid really thrives on sick care, and and the the, the people taking care of sicker patients tend to, uh, quite frankly, get paid more. Uh, and uh, the uh, the primary care apparatus, which is which is really working to keep patients healthier, um, you know kind of see short shrift and I think changing that payment model I think offers the opportunity to do that and then you say well you know how do you pay for that and the reality is is keeping there's there's, there's much more money um, available in keeping patients healthier and the money saved uh, you know is is much greater and and there's you know a double win or a triple win there because you have patients who are much more satisfied when they're healthier and you have um, you know, patients uh, that just feel much better about what's going on with them and they'd rather be healthy. So I think that um, changing that payment model, I think, is is one of the opportunities and then figuring out how we're going to get from point A to point B because you can't just snap your fingers and change it. But that's, I think, one of the opportunities of how we're going to innovate around this, but also how primary care is going to, you know, take its place and really, you know, leading the healthcare system of the future. 
great. Thanks, John. And Sunny, your your big takeaway from this, and of course, you're living now or about to live into the middle of the transformation at CVS Health and Aetna. So, speak to it if, to the degree you can from that perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know we're going to jump in that uh, a little bit later in the webinar too. But uh, first, two things that would definitely uh, second John's points and and Susan, thanks for your leadership um, for. Uh, the entire report and what we were able to put together that was really really big for um for Nehi's uh kind of uh, leadership on putting the healthcare without walls report together i'd say two takeaways for our our folks uh on the webinar um that i really thought was you know as john and i were both on the reimbursement group one is we really got to think about how we do this from a multi-channel perspective um and you addressed it very well susan in the telemedicine platform it's always very striking to me that you know Kaiser's tipping over 50% of their visits are now virtual, and everyone else isn't isn't doing it. I mean, what happened? Did we just? <laughs> or did, did, or why are they doing this and we're not? Or, or, or vice versa? Uh, or, or why are they are they doing something that frankly isn't really the wave of the future? Uh, what's preventing us from doing this? A lot of it, I believe, is in that reimbursement uh, kind of schematic, right? And that's what's where you're seeing one system fully capitated, owns all their members, delivery system integrated with the payer model. You know, they're pushing the model forward. We have a bunch of other systems, payers, et cetera, who are lagging behind. So the one takeaway, takeaway one is, we've really got to think about how we want to address multi-channel um, healthcare. And, and telemedicine is a broad term for one. And soon we're gonna get into worlds where you take your blood pressure uh, virtually, you take your sugars virtually, uh, and you go to the gym, the Peloton is now becoming the craze where, you know, you can get on a bike and, and, and work out with a big group virtually. I mean, there's going to be multi-channel type of things that we need to think about from a, re from a reimbursement standpoint. So, you know, if, if it's the right thing to do, let's make it happen as soon as possible versus sort of lagging. And, and, and we've seen this in the telemedicine sector, right? Like, here comes Kaiser, 50% greater than virtual visits, and everyone else is sort of lagging. And, Maybe by the time we say this together, if, if we assume for a moment that the telemedicine is the great thing for us to do, and, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we think maybe there's a combination of virtual and in-person visits that will be needed. But, um, you know, so anyways, my point is that there may be more streamlining as we start to think about multi-channel care. The second takeaway point I think that we talked about uh, in our group um, in the Healthcare Without Walls is the idea of really trying to crack the nut around patient or member incentives. And we, can, we can put the best chassis out there. You know, the slide was explained well. I mean, do we have Star Wars care on a Flintstone chassis? Okay, let's, let's, let's take the Flintstone chassis and make it Star Wars chassis. All right, now we got all Star Wars, everything. Okay, <laughs> to use your analogy. Yep. But if we don't incentivize the patient, right, are we still sort of shooting ourselves in the foot? Um, you know, and so I think that a lot more thought needs to be thought about how we really incentivize the member or the patient. And right now, there's a lot of stifling, constricting regulations around that, those thinking processes. Um, and I think if that gets unleashed, we can really make a big difference um, for what we're all trying to accomplish, which is a, a higher value healthcare system, better outcomes, lower costs. And Sonny, you made the point in our group that you know, how about taking some of the dollars that now all flow to the healthcare system? The idea being, patient, you will walk into the system and we will help you and we will make you better and we're the ones who get all the money. And how about funneling a little piece of that back to the patient and saying, look, here's some incentives for you to self-manage all the time you're in home or in the community or in the workplace. And if you have this incentive to manage yourself better, you will be healthier. That's the argument you were framing. Is that the kind of thing you're going to be thinking about at, at CVS Aetna? You know, we're, we are going to be thinking about that. Um, and, and, and a lot of this is still based in, in, uh, in government regulation and how, you know, how the system is built around it. But you know, I'm glad you're re recalling my memory, and, and, and that, that is the truth, right? We, we sort of have some – our system sort of is designed by – We'll machinate in the background, and you, patient, or you, member of the COG, you just go be healthy. And then after you go be healthy, ha-ha, we win the money. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, 
right, right. You, the patient who did all the work and ran on the gym and ate the kale and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, good for you. And you can live longer, but that's the only incentive you get. And that's a delayed incentive. And we know through behavioral change science that that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. And so, in fact, we already have the evidence. We can look at an obesity map around the country, right? I mean, so the, I think that the, I think that we're going to be thinking a little bit about how can we provide incentives? And now we're going to, we're expanding the arms of being able to do that, which as you've mentioned in your slide that Larry, Larry talked about, if we go local, you know, and we create unmatched human connections through innovation and, you know, you can come in and get your, your, we can think about it more innovatively in terms of, all right, how do we provide those incentives, whether it be on medications, whether it be on how people buy products, we have three arms now. We have an insurance arm, we have a PBM arm, and we have a retail arm. Those are three huge levers we could potentially start to integrate and create some of those incentives that drive a little bit of that behavior change and let some of those resources, if you would, come back to the member. So that's exactly what we've been thinking about in, in the world that we will be able to have a little bit of control over. And John, I know uh, you've been doing a lot of thinking about how the uh, Geisinger Health Plan enrollees who are Medicare Advantage enrollees uh, give Geisinger a kind of a unique space to innovate on payment because because you're, some of those patients are seeing Geisinger providers, but Geisinger is also the insurer, at least the health plan is the insurer. And that does give Geisinger an opportunity for innovation in that space. How do you see uh, care going, particularly primary care, as we look at models that are evolving like Geisinger at home? Uh, how much of that do you think is going to become a feature of the, of the, of the sort of overall care experience at Geisinger and, for, and particularly for those enrolled in Geisinger Health Plan? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Susan. I, I, think, I think you're going to see more and more of the you know, in the case of Geisinger at home, it's taking the sickest of the sick. So um, those patients are seniors who generally have five or more chronic diseases. And um, we're actually going to them instead of uh, waiting for them to come to us. And, and it's interesting because when we realized when we've done that, there was a little bit of a concern. Well, uh, and, and when we do it, we 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 have a team uh, there's physicians who are leading it, but uh, there's um, nurse practitioners and um, community health assistants and, and other people who are part of the team that, that go in the home. And, and there was some worry, I think, around when we started it, well, you know, what were the primary care physicians going to think about it? And w we did it in a way which was uh, very coexistent with the primary care physicians. The, the patients uh, still keep the primary care physicians were in a program, but we act as a conduit with the primary care physicians. And what we realized was a lot of these patients were those patients that uh, frustrated primary care as well because they couldn't see them. They weren't coming to see them. And what, what, when they touched the healthcare system, they touched the healthcare system through the emergency room and through the hospital and, and the uh, you know, their primary care physicians really couldn't, you know, get to them to see them. So it's been a, uh, it's really been a, a huge win from that standpoint. The reality though, is if you were in a, in a fee for service model, you might not even, and you probably wouldn't even do this because the, the, the fee for service payment for doing that um, really isn't going to say, get you to say, well, I'm, I'm going to start um, seeing patients at home and I'm going to form a team to do that. Whereas, you know, if you're in a in a risk model the way we are, um, the the dollars saved by decreasing patients going to the emergency room and decreasing patients who are in a hospital and keeping them in their own home more than uh, pay for the um, the program. And and as I said earlier, what you see is you see uh, about healthier patients and you see happier patients when you do that. So it's one of those an, another one of those things I think because of a uh, kind of a different view of the world, I guess, because of the payment model, you end up where doing the right thing for the patient ends up being something that actually is is better for the system. And I, and I think, you know, we do need to, you know, as Sonny said it well, we do need to figure out ways that in the healthcare system, we need to understand that, that you know, is worth saving money. It can't just be worth saving money. So, 
you know, we have more money uh, as a system of healthcare or those of us who are caregivers, we have to get to the point where you're actually seeming, seeing premiums not increase year over year. And, and even to the point where you're seeing premiums go down um, year over year when we do this. I think the, the biggest barriers we we see rate limiting steps to doing this sometimes is actually getting the the providers, interestingly with Geisinger Home, it's been getting the, the caregivers to do it, whether it's the physicians in primary care or whether it's nurse practitioners or whether it's nurses, um, especially in the area we are given the nursing shortage and and um, and in many cases a physician uh, shortage be able to do that. But I think you see the same thing. Uh, we've been starting to work with, with uh, telemedicine visits, uh, you know, Sonny mentioned Kaiser and, you know, when we look at putting those in place, we're looking at it more from a holistic view. So instead of where a direct to consumer organization may say, well, how can I uh, put telemedicine visits out there so that, um, you know, I have a business model to be able to see the patients and while I am adding convenience and maybe um, adding um, um, help to the patients, I'm also increasing the healthcare costs. Whereas we look at it more as how can we use technology as a tool to be able to extend access. So if you can see someone via a telemedicine visit, then you don't have to have them come into your bricks and mortar building and you can get the patients who really need to see the physician in a bricks and mortar building, like the complicated um, medical patients into that building to uh, see them. So that you, you actually kind of, uh, you decant the access, you decant the patients who don't need to come into bricks and mortar, keep them healthier and doing that. And you uh, better use your bricks and mortar that exists for patients that really need that. And as you said, there's still going to be patients, no matter what we do, that need ICUs and they need to come in to see the primary care physician face to face. And they, they you know, are going to need to uh, and do things in, in hospitals, but uh, if if you can decant out those patients that don't need to, and I think change the paradigm so patients that we think today have to be there actually don't in the future, that's going to be the big win. Well, uh, you both uh, could could not have said it better, and I know uh, Anne probably wants to get a, a little bit to some questions that have come in from the group. So, Anne, shall we turn this over to you? Sure, and thank you so much for a fascinating okay. discussion. Um, there are webinars that we do that should go an hour and a half, and clearly this is one of them. But um, let me at least get uh, one or two questions uh, um, uh, on, on the table if I could. The first relates to that very interesting study from uh, Parkinson's and telehealth and um, consumer patient responses. Uh, and you know, it was surprising to see, and, and it was very interesting to see how patients responded on different dimensions. Um, is, has anyone done a synthesis of, you know, patient views of, of healthcare without walls? Or, and if not, let's get the Corey on it, or I don't know if there is enough in the literature, but I wanted to ask you all, as you were doing your report, if there was any uh, systematic look at that literature to try to understand, you know, uh, patient views. And I'm sure there is, no, there is no one patient view. I'm sure it's very much contingent on uh, type of patient. Yes, and you could see that in just the response to that study. I mean, not everybody was exactly on the same page about aspects of the virtual care that they liked, but but the majority kind of was, right? They, the majority preferred them. And uh, the, the the best uh, synthesis that has been done, I think, has been done by PCORI. They have funded a, a fair amount, a fair number, I should say, of these uh, telemedicine type of studies. Most of them uh, basically have, have well, concluded that the out the way the studies get structured they they pretty much conclude that the care is the, the same no no uh, certainly but they do tend to show huge patient satisfaction across the board for all different types of patients including patients with severe and persistent mental illness who have access to things like a very innovative uh, f a smartphone-based support systems where if they're having symptoms, they can have an interaction with a clinician to help walk them through, you know, the voices you're hearing. Remember, we've spoken about the voices in the past and the voices aren't always telling the truth. Do you remember that? Yes, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are all kinds of these avenues of support that, that Bacori has studied and they do tend to show across the board high levels of patient satisfaction. 
Yeah. And I, this is John. I would just add that, 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 I mean, what we've seen internally, and there is some published literature that uh, the satisfaction is high, but also that we've seen that patients would like to see that coming from their own doctor or, or their own doctor's practice. You know, understanding that their own doctor may not be doing telemedicine, but someone affiliated with that practice is mm -hmm. the person doing the telemedicine, and that it's mm -hmm. that the records are shared, and that they know that that their doctor is going to know about that interaction. I, I, and so I think that coordination and that systems yeah. approach is, is extremely important. And I think you'll see more, uh, you know, uptake uh, as you see that coordination. And I know, you know, that's what's trying to happen with what we're doing. It's what uh, you know, CVS Aetna is thinking about with, you know, it's how do you coordinate that care? Right. So your practice has a memory and they, you know, understand you in a comprehensive way and, and the care is integrated and coordinated and therein can be, you know, um, a, a relationship with the practice, if not with the individual clinician. Um, another uh, question is related to chronic care conditions because, um, I know we had uh, CVS at our most recent conference, and um, Troy Brennan actually at a at a recent PCPCC board meeting. Um, so maybe Sunny, you could talk a little bit about um, CVS Aetna and chronic care management, or just in general, um, if there's time for any other comments about how technology can support management of chronic health conditions. Uh, yes, what is um, optimal, but also, you know, where some of the, the challenges may lie. Yeah, we, we, this is a big issue for us, and, and, and I know I mean, we're hitting on time, so I'll try to be brief. Um, John and Susan mentioned that, uh, some great comments just a second ago here about, you know, how do we really tackle chronic conditions? Um, uh, our strategy is the, you know, our, our strategy that we've sort of thought about pretty hard in the CVS in the world is to create unmatched human connections to transform the health care experience. Now, it sounds a little lofty, but the idea is really to, it's, it's based around a couple core principles, one of them being we just want to, we want to make things local because we think that trust is a really key factor that what leverages behavior change and, and optimal chronic care management. Um, John alluded to this. He said, you know, we, we really need to think about how we deal with chronic care by people who can see their own doctor. So our, our, our thought is either we do that with a telemedicine platform, you can see your network provider, which just as a little side point, it's hard You're creating a network where you can see your own network provider versus a teledoc or a doctor on demand or even a Kaiser or Geising when you have an integrated system. It's difficult with all these multi-systems for us, but that's our, that's our charge is to figure out how we can do that, um, make it local and make it simple. We really want to make it simple and we really want to make sure that we can improve health. So our thesis is, Chronic care management isn't super, super, super hard. What's the tough part is really making it very simple for folks to be able to engage their own health to where they understand it better for their own personalized life. And the thesis is, listen, if we're local and, and 70 to 80% of America lives within 10 minutes of a CVS, and we'll be able to create that trust. We'll be able to create that activation of these members. And then once we have that, Maybe we, we will link that in with chronic care management, i.e. someone you see chronically, whether it be your network provider, whether it be your pharmacist, we can start to make a significant delta in chronic care management. So that's, that's how we're sort of thinking about this. Thank you. Well, um, clearly so many uh, more things we'd love to explore if we just had a little more time today. And um, we'll, we'll uh, perhaps have you back um, for another discussion. So thank you so much um, and um, happy holidays to everyone. Thank you for everyone who's still on the line. We have hundreds of people still on the line, so I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you again to Susan, Sonny, and John for their fabulous work and their, and their contributions to moving our healthcare system forward. Bye now. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone.